Faculty Career Award, an FSMP Research Chair, and a Simons Investigator Award. His research is seen. His research is situated at the intersection of uh, cryptography, quantum computing, complexity theory, um, and he is most well known for his work on the study of entanglement in interactive proof systems, obtaining a breakthrough result, uh, proving that the complexity class MIP star equals RE. Uh, he has made multiple contributions to quantum cryptography, and we'll let him tell us about some of these in his talk. Um, So, uh, hey everyone. So my understanding is that the people on Zoom should be able to hear me. Good. I'm not going yes, to be monitoring. Yes, we can. Oh, good. This was a yes, right? That was a yes. Yeah, excellent. And I could also hear you, so then uh, we know that you can unmute yourself and speak up uh, during the talk if you if you'd like to. Uh, you might not be able to see me because if you guys see me, I see the webcam and not my audience. So, um, uh, okay, okay, I'll just maybe stand here. Um, okay, well, they don't care about seeing me, so it's okay. Uh, all right, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, okay, so first of all, uh, thanks, Nexita, for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's my first time at UIUC, so I'm very happy to visit. Um, I also just heard in the corridors that this might be one of the first iQuest, at least seminars in, in person. So um, this might be a little bit my fault. So that she had invited me something like two years ago uh, to give an online seminar. And I said, oh, online, I don't want to do that. So we waited until we could do it. Oh, and by the way, is it okay if I, um, everyone's okay, including people at the front? Yeah, so I'll just do that. It's easier for me. Also for the mic, it's easier. Um, so anyways, we pushed the visit and now it, it finally happened. So I personally am very happy to see uh, people in person and I get to, I, I hope I get to, to talk to some of you. I'm here for two and a half days or something. So um, feel free to you know, uh, talk to me later if you're interested. Okay, so um, I, I was preparing this talk under the assumption that the audience is pretty broad. Like I don't know most of you. And so I was expecting maybe some people from physics, maybe some computer scientists, maybe mostly computer scientists, but not exclusively, maybe mathematicians. So I try to keep the talk pretty light. Um, I hope I didn't go too far and up to make it boring. Um, my goal is to introduce and motivate uh, a, a particular problem about quantum computation, which is the, the problem of uh, testing and verifying uh, quantum devices. So, so I'll spend a fair amount of time on motivation and, and a little bit of background. Um, and th then at some point I'll get a little bit more technical and explain an approach that uh, uh, that, 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 that we developed with these co-authors and, and authors and others to, to that problem. And if I have time, I might uh, even manage to end with some uh, experimental results, which, which would be a total first for me. So, so let's see if we get there. Uh, so feel free to interrupt on Zoom and, 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 and here with, with questions. Um, so, okay, right? yeah. So, okay, so this first slide, everyone knows this, but it's just kind of to, to set the stage. So the point that I want to make is that um, we're in an interesting moment uh, in quantum computing. So, so the field started like 30 years ago with some breakthrough theoretical uh, discoveries. So Shor's algorithm for factoring, uh, fault tolerant quantum computation. This seemed to be like a new model of computation that allowed us to achieve you know, a reasonable model, no infinities, no arbitrary um, precisions or things like this that, that allows you us to do computation, solve computation tasks efficiently. We didn't know how to solve before. Um, but 30 years ago, this is what quantum computers looked like. I mean, you know, this was all very theoretical. It was theoretically exciting, um, but we did, had no ways to, to test our ideas. Um, now, time has passed, and we've entered, uh, you know, in the past maybe like five, six years, uh, a new era. It's the era that my, my colleague, John Preskill uh, at Caltech, qualified as NISQ. So NISQ stands for Noisy uh, Intermediate Scale Quantum. So it's kind of like these devices. So this is the, the latest uh, Google uh, chip. And so what's, what's special about the devices that are being built is that um, they're noisy. Uh, in particular, they're not able to implement full torrent computation. So you can't run any of these like dream algorithms from 30 years ago. Um, you definitely cannot run, run them on, on, on those machines because of the noise and also because of the limited size. Uh, so you can't do all the things that you want to do. Um, on the other hand, uh, they are at a size that you can't simulate anymore, or at least if you try to 
this is the simulation, 2 to the 53, that's just kind of like an inch above uh, what we're able to do in any reasonable amount of time. And so one of the exciting questions that this poses is, is whether this is real, right? Whether we've entered the era where quantum effects can be harnessed in order to solve computational tasks that cannot be solved in, in, in other ways. And we're trying to figure that out based on these kinds of chips um, where, you know, I said brute force simulation doesn't, uh, doesn't let you predict the behavior of the chip, but this doesn't mean that there's a shortcut, uh, right? And because the amount of control that you have on the device and the amount of error that it's subject to are so high and the control is limited, it's not clear that there might be a shortcut or not. Um, and so what we're trying to come up with is uh, protocols, ways to operate uh, the device, ways to interact with it, that would allow us to use it in order to gain the highest possible level of confidence that something non-classical uh, has taken place. So this is kind of the very broad question that I want to address, and I'm going to very adversarial, or sometimes we call it black box model. So, so here's going to be the, the, the model for the entire talk. So we imagine that we have, um, I'll call it a quantum device. So it's something that was uh, that was built. It's, it's, you know, it's a chip or it's a, like an optical table or any kind of thing. Um, but the way that we interact with it is that we don't, we don't really get to look at it directly. It, we imagine that it's in it's some kind of a box. And we interact with the box, not with the device. Um, so what we can do to the box is we can give it instructions. We can tell it, you know, please run this circuit, please do this computation. Uh, so these instructions are in English, so it's just the classical information. Um, and, then, and then we get to observe some output data. Uh, and then based on that data, we can go back and you know, change the instructions, ask it to perform something else, and then we get new data, uh, et cetera. And the kind of questions that we're trying to answer is, well, okay, like what's going on in that box? Is, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it a truly quantum phenomenon? Um, can I um, verify the computation that is performing, if it's performing a computation, or can I verify some other property of it, for example, you know, the number of qubits that it has or, or something? So just to make it clear, the picture that you have to have in mind, it's like, the, so this device is, uh, so you imagine that you, you're the PI, okay? So you have the corner office at the top floor or something like this. Um, and then you build some quantum device, but the quantum device is in the basement. Um, and there's no way you're gonna go down to the basement uh, to, to check the device. Uh, instead, that's why you have students. Um, and so you're upstairs with the coffee machine, the students come to you, you tell the students, please do this experiment. The student goes to the basement, you don't really know what's going on there. They come back up with some result and you look at it and you're like, hmm, Okay, why don't you do this other experiment? Okay, and just based on that data, not knowing anything else, uh, not knowing anything else, uh, we're, we're trying to ascertain the, the problems of the, of the device. Just to make the distinction clear, let me tell you about some opposite uh, approach, which is which is which is widely used uh, in practice, which is not what I want to talk about, uh, which is which is benchmarking. So in benchmarking, you typically assume that you have a much more fine-grained access on the device. For example, you could have a, a circuit, that's a quantum circuit, uh, you, you want it to be executed. Um, so you program the device so that it ex executes it, and then you want to test uh, you know, how well it has been executed. And the way you test that is by um, kind of changing the circuit a little bit. So you change one of the gates, um, or maybe you will say, okay, what if I do like an intervention? I don't run the first gate, instead I prepare, the state zero, one plus minus there, and then I see what happens at the output. And you, you can do this at, uh, on, on, on the wires at different levels in your circuit in order to test that uh, the individual gates work well, that the wires work well, that all your state preparation and measurement operations uh, work well. So that's a very, in, you know, in my language, that's, that's a, the white box model because uh, you allow yourself to really look at individual gates. And for example, you're assuming that um, you know, if I prepare a state on this wire and make a measurement later, the gate that's applied in between is exactly the same gate that would have been applied if I hadn't made these interventions and I had put the two Hadamards uh, outside. In the black box model, um, you don't know that that's the case. Black box model, you just say the whole sequence and then whatever gets implemented can depend on the whole sequence. It can be different every time you do it. You don't, you're not allowed to say, okay, you know, fix some parts of the experiment and change uh, some of this. The picture is this, this is like what, the, you know, uh, kind of the trusted, the white box model where you have access to the device, you trust it, you trust maybe this person, maybe not. Um, and the black box model is more like this, okay? So you don't, this device, who, who knows who built it? Um, uh, and anyways, you, they're not, you know, there's a warranty, you can't open it. And so you just have to type stuff on the computer and then you're just trying to test it in, 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 in this way. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like this. Um, 
Um, all right, so um, let's see. Um, let me give some motivations for, for why, why such an adversarial model. So maybe just, I won't come back to randomized benchmarking, but, but in practice, uh, it's really the kind of thing that you do and that you want to do. Okay, in practice, you can access individual components, you can vary some, and you're not worried about um, some 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 large scale effect going wrong. You can you can test, um, and so this is you do that. But where I'm coming from, the kind of questions that we're interested in that, that motivates this this black box model. So here are, are three motivations for it. One is the motivation that I started the talk with, which is that uh, you know, if really you're trying to test that um, quantum mechanics, quantum computers, quantum computation does scale, uh, then it's not going to be sufficient to say, oh, I tested all the individual components. So when I put them together, you know, I also put like two and four of them together. What's going to go wrong when I put 16, right? So, so it's fine. So I can just extrapolate. Uh, so so we're, we're actively not taking that point of view and saying, no, like I'm not, you know, that's the whole thing that I want to test if, I, if, if extrapolation is possible or not. So that's the, the fundamental question. That there, there's some more practical motivations. One of them is, um, you know, one of the possible applications for quantum computation is, is quantum computation in the cloud, where you imagine that you have just uh, a few large devices and, and many uh, users. And so the way the user um, makes use of the device is by sending instructions. So they say, okay, please run my quantum circuit. And then this is, let, let's say, uh, you know, the Amazon cloud or something. Uh, they run the computation and then they return an outcome to you. Um, a, and then, you know, you'd like to have some guarantee that this outcome is correct without having to go and open their servers, um, right? And because you asked them to do the computation for you in the first place, it's not like you can reproduce this outcome yourself. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't have asked. Uh, so you need to set it up uh, in a way that the outcome comes with some kind of a guarantee or a proof that it's been computed uh, directly. Just to give an example of why this problem can be solved. So um, this, this talk computing is something that you can do uh, if you're you know, curious and new to the field and want to play, you can actually log into IBM website and there's also some others and access some of their devices. So I did this a while ago, they have bigger devices now. I took one of the smallest ones, it has five qubits. So you see the five qubits and on the top right are the error rates that they report. And so you can draw your own circuit. Um, so I drew the simplest interesting circuit I could think of. Um, I took the middle qubit, it's, it's the one that has the lowest error, so I just, just you know, played safe. And I'm doing a Hadamard on that qubit and then measuring. Uh, okay, so that's a circuit that generates a random bit. Uh, and that's interesting because I don't have any classical way of generating random bits, but there's a very simple quantum circuit that does it. So, so, so I wanted to check that, that, that they do it correctly. So, so then I did it, I run the, you know, I told them, please run the experiment. And in fact, they run it, I don't know how many times, like maybe a thousand or a million times. And they report statistics. So they told me they got zero 50.2% of the time and one 49.8% of the time. The question is, am I happy or not? Um, that's correct, right? Uh, and I, in fact, I kind of knew it, right? I could run the survey myself. I knew it should be 50-50. They also know that. They know that if they tell me 50-50, it's going to be a bit suspicious. So change a little bit the number. Um, here, the point that I'm making is that in running this kind of circuit in my, in my black box device, what I'm interested in is not the outcome necessarily, okay? Here, I could predict the outcome it was 50-50, zero, or I couldn't predict, but I knew what the statistics should be. Why am I interested in this circuit? Maybe because I'm running uh, like a casino or maybe I'm doing cryptography. What I really care about is that this number is really random, right? I don't care that the statistics are correct. I mean, of course they need to be correct, but I care about something much more, which is that they didn't choose the number. I want the number to have been shouldn't have been planted by someone else. So that, that's not a property of the number itself, like the number of the outcome of the, of the device, zero or one. Um, randomness is a property of the process, okay? I wanna make sure that this number has been generated by a quantum process that generates entropy. Um, and so even in this very like small scale problem, you, you have a fundamental question that's, uh, that's interesting. How do you set it up so that you know that the number has been generated? Um, okay. If you didn't get what I, what I, what I, what I said, here's a, a, like a cartoon way of, uh, of saying what's the problem with testing a random number generator, okay? Because like any outcome that it gives you is just, is just fine. So what do you do? I try to say in the talk some things that uh, that you can do. Um, before going there, um, let me talk about a few different approaches to sort of like lay very broadly um, explain uh, the, the the lay of the land. Um, so oh, I'm sorry, I didn't finish my motivations. Like the last motivation was connected to what I just said. 
For this black box model is of course cryptographic applications. So, so for example, quantum random number generation, or you could say QKD or, or some other applications, where there it's kind of like baked in in your goals that, that you just don't trust uh, the other users. And you might not even trust the equipment that you're using because, because you bought it and that who knows if it's functioning well. It's really crucial for the security of your cryptographic implementation that the numbers are generated randomly. And so you need a way to, 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 to test not necessarily being you know, a prolific experimental or a talented experimentalist yourself. Yeah, I wanted to state the obvious, which is what, what makes the task difficult. And, and there's, there's two things. One is, is uh, exponential scaling. So this is when you want to try to verify like larger processes, like this Sycamore chip that I mentioned that I described before. If, if you do the, the five qubit device, you can, you know, any kind of circuit that's run on that, you can just like in your head, calculate what the outcome should be. But as it gets bigger, you have this exponential scale, naively exponential scaling of the, of the system size up to, um, okay, this one was never built, uh, but it, they tried to build it. And if they had built it, it's interesting because two to the 70 is, I forgot how many hexabytes, but it's the size of Google's data centers. So Google was announcing that they were building a quantum chip so that to simulate it, you needed to use all of the data set. We're just at the limit where really things just, you can't simulate anymore. And then the other one is the more that I made using the quantum random number um, exa ex example, which is that you know if you, if you try to, there's no way in general, in principle, even to completely characterize the state of your quantum device. You're gonna like make some experiments and ask some measurements to be performed, but each of these perturbs um, the state. You can't capture snapshots. Snapshots would be quantum states, and you have no way of observing these quantum states. You have no way of representing them. Uh, so that's that's the other difficulty that uh, that we're facing. Um, right, so, um, and these are not all approaches to the same problem. Uh, so I'm I'm being very broad here. The question that you could have in mind, like the broadest question, is just the question of testing that there's some quantum behavior that's going on. But you could have more refined questions, testing that a specific quantum behavior has been going on, like randomness generation, or a specific circuit has been executed, or a specific optimization problem has been solved. Okay, um, but in general, let's say we're just interested about testing quantum behavior, like, and I'm saying this pretty loosely. So I'm going to rank different approaches on on two scales. Uh, one scale I called um, practicality. So this just means like, okay, how likely is it that we're going to be able to implement it you know, today or in, in a few years? And the other is usefulness. Um, that's also pretty loose. It just means how much do I truly care uh, about this, this particular um, task? Okay, so the first one um, is, is usually one of the first answers that pops to mind for computer scientists is to say, well, if you're trying to test that your device is quantum, why don't you ask it to factor a large number? We don't know any classical ways to factor large numbers. Um, if someone does factor a large number for you, it's easy to check, so just why don't you do it, right? And once you factor, I'll be convinced. The main with that approach, one is that it's, it's not very practical. So if you do kind of back of the envelope kind of calculations, in order to factor cryptographic size numbers, you need about 10,000 false star end qubits. And if you add error correction, that's like a factor of thousand or something. So it's, it's 100,000 or maybe a million uh, noisy qubits in order to factor. So hopefully we'll get there, but my estimate is that it will be at least like a decade or maybe two decades. So, okay, so we just can't do it. And even if we could on the usefulness axis, it's not really useful because who wants to factor numbers? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, people who want to break crypto, right? Who want to break RSA, but uh, within the next 10 years, RSA is going to be replaced by something else. Um, so then you'd be left to you know breaking secrets from 10 years ago, right? Going to government archives and saying, oh, like you have this thing and it was encrypted 10 years ago, and now I can break it. Okay, so that that's that's that is some applications, but it is kind of niche, right? Um so um second approach is gonna be on the opposite end of the practicality scale. So it's what's going on now. Uh, so you've probably seen these headlines uh, by by so this was the two or three years ago by, by Google claiming quantum computational uh, supremacy and that there's been follow-ups by, um, by other groups. So let me explain um, a little bit what these does, uh, what these do. So what these experiments do is that they say, okay, your device is noisy, so I can't run really a circuit of my choice. 
So instead, let me just program it at random. So I just choose a random circuit and I ask this, the device to run it. The idea would be that because it's random, even if there's errors, not like these errors are going to be adversarial, right? They're just, they're going to affect it, but in, in pretty benign uh, ways, hopefully. Uh, so we run this quantum random circuit and we measure the outputs. So we get samples from a distribution. Um, and we hope that we can make some claim that this distribution can be generated by any classical device. Um, on the practical axis, this, this ranks pretty uh, high because the experiments have been done, at, at, at least on a certain, on a certain size. Um, um, one of them is that um, it's not so useful. Okay, so you run a random circuit and then what? Uh, okay, then you publish a nature paper and you make all the headlines, so it's good for, for the company, but it's not clear at all how you move forward. You know, then, then what next? Actually, as far as I know, there's, there's nothing in, 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 in what next. Um, in, in fact, there's even a deeper problem, which is that um, th this specific task, random circuit sampling and other similar, sim similar uh, tasks, verification that the task has been accomplished is almost as hard as uh, spoofing, which means like, you know, classically fooling the task. And so six that we can kind of verify, uh, given the data, that it, 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 it's, it's, it's correct, like it, 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 it exhibits the correct statistics. 70 qubits, we a priori have like a bigger, um, you know, bigger gap between quantum and classical, but the problem is that 70 qubits, we won't be able to verify uh, uh, 70 bit strings and we just won't know if it has been generated correctly or not. So we're stuck. And in fact, even at 60 qubits, they're kind of stuck already. And so the, you know, the way these, these uh, experiments are verified is using um, like heuristics. Um, so you, you, you don't, you check signatures of the distribution that's being produced. It kind of has the right looking tails or the right looking entropy or things like that. Um, and these signatures can be spoofed. And so this is why, you know, if you follow a little bit this, you saw that there was a Google experiment and then someone from IBM comes up and says, oh, but actually we can simulate it. And then something changes in the quantum side and then someone fools it. And now it's really at the stage where, you know, three years down, um, it's pretty easy on a laptop to generate data that passes all the statistical tests that Google ran on their data. Okay, so it took like three years to figure out all the loopholes, but, but they were figured out. Okay, so to me, that seems like a big limitation of this, uh, of this kind of approach. It's a bit more useful. It's okay, I put, you know, this is random circuit sampling, QAOA, VQE. So these are um, uh, algorithms, optimization algorithms that um, people are designing in order to run on the, even the small noisy devices that we have. Um, they're typically hybrid kind of algorithms where you have a circuit in mind, you run it on the quantum device, then you perform some classical computation on the side, like some graded descent or something to change the circuit that you're running. Then you run the circuit again, um, estimate how good it's doing in terms of your optimization problem. Um, then you change the parameters of the circuit. Classically, you choose the best parameters according to some metric, uh, and then you run the circuit again. So you do this back and forth. There's there's different um, there's different approaches to this. So QAOA it means quantum approximate optimization algorithm is one of them. VQE is a whole class of approaches that that uh, tries to find ground states of Hamiltonians um, by tries to design circuits that produce ground states of Hamiltonians exactly in the way that that I described. Um, so these are sort of practical. I mean, I put them a bit below because as far as I know, uh, these are generally run on simulators uh, at the moment. There's experiments that are done, but they don't, they don't give results that are particularly uh, useful. But potentially they could become practical in the next five years. That's, that's the hope. In terms of usefulness, um, I feel that I was generous and I put it there, um, but I put a question mark because these are really heuristics. It's a, bit, it's a bit like machine learning, you know, not to be dismissive about machine learning, but the, the value of machine learning is in how successful it is, uh, much more than the kind of theorems that you can prove about it. Um, and so at the moment, because we can't run these, we know how successful they'll be, um, and we definitely cannot prove theorems about them. And so it's kind of an open question uh, whether these will be useful in the, in the, in the near future or, or not. Okay, and the last one, which I could have put first because it's the oldest one. You know, if you say, okay, you want to test quantumness, how do you do that? You do a bad experiment. And these have been done, you know, since the 80s. Uh, this is the, the first, uh, the famous loophole free experiment in Delft in 2012. And this is more recent uh, satellite experiments that were done in, in, uh, in China. Um, 
So Bell experiments, I put them there. They're very practical in the sense that, you know, they, what I just said, they, they were they were achieved in 2012. So that, that's a decade uh, ago. That's before uh, anything there. So just in case someone doesn't know about the Bell experiment, what you're doing is that you're setting up a specific but small quantum system between two distant locations, um, Alice you go there and Bob there, and then you're making measurements on it. And you're just, just like my black box model, you're just, the only thing you're observing is the inputs and the outputs. And then you're plotting that and you're observing what distribution it is. Because it's small, you can do full statistics and just completely estimate all the probabilities. Um, and then you have theorems, mathematical theorems that say that these kinds of distributions you observed that you can observe using quantum mechanics, they could not have been generated if the word was uh, world was classical, if there was no if there was no one time. Okay. So that's a very convincing uh, test of quantumness. It's it's very practical. The problem is the usefulness. So you know it's it's a bit like the random circuit sampling. Then you'd say, okay, then okay, what next? Right? You've done your demonstration, but then what? Um, I, I put it quite a bit above uh, because in fact uh, you can do much more. You can test quantum states. You can even test. Uh, you can test randomness using them. You can even test certain kinds of computations. Um, these are things that I worked on, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about. Um, even though I put it in the abstract, but I realize I won't have time, so I'm not going to talk about it uh, in the talk. Uh, the main reason I'm putting them aside is because of this special isolation assumption. That is something that you can argue a little bit about the practicality of it. And when you do a small scale experiment, you can do it fast enough and far enough that that you, you have. Um, confidence that spatial isolation was uh, was enforced was observed, but as you try to do more complex things, it becomes very unwieldy. And so, moving forward, I think that that that's a good setting for cryptography, um, but it's not a good setting for testing uh, computation. So it seems like we'd prefer to do uh, something different. Technical, like. Uh, our approach, like, like a particular approach to test of quantumness, test of computation, quantum computation, these things. Um, uh, so where I'm going now is that I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about interactive proofs. So interactive proofs is uh, some some framework from uh, from complexity theory that uh, that models these kinds of black box interactions that um, uh, that that I introduced early on in the talk. So I'll, I'll say a bit of general things about that, and then um, I'll, I'll 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 introduce some ideas uh, from cryptography that will eventually allow us to to design protocols for for testing the, the quantum device. Uh, so, um, you know, for those who know complexity theory, this, 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 you know, but I think not everyone knows complexity theory. So I, I, I just, uh, just to give the flavor of it, I'll, I'll start broad with things that, that, that maybe everyone knows. So, so complexity theory uh, classifies computational problems uh, in terms of, of their difficulty. Um, and you have to decide what you mean by difficulty. Um, so the simplest thing is to, is, is, is class P captures all those problems. Okay, for example, uh, primality testing, is you're given an integer and you're trying to decide if the problem is if the integer is prime or not. And these are all problems that can be decided in polynomial time. So in the following sense, you have a certain algorithm. This algorithm knows what problem it's trying to solve. Okay, for example, primality. Uh, then it receives uh, an integer as input. This integer is just represented as a bit string in binary decomposition. Um, it can execute a number of operations that should scale at most some fixed polynomial, like n cubed, for example, in the length of the input. And, and then it has to produce it. Okay. So if your problem can be solved correctly in, by this kind of procedure, then we say that it's a point of time. It's point of time for solving things in P. So we we like you know all problems to be in P because because we can solve them, but but they don't they don't all lie in P. And so when they don't, we try to find some other features of the problem that uh, um, that that makes it uh, solvable. And so uh, um, another. Um, an example uh, such feature is that the problem you might not be able to solve it yourself, but if someone gives you a proof that the solution is uh, yes, you can verify that proof. So examples are colorability or maybe factoring. I should I should use since I've, I've talked about it before. So here you're again uh, given an integer as input. Oh well, no factoring is not a decision problem. Sorry, forget about factoring. Okay, let's do graph colorability. Yeah, ignore that. Um, so you're given as input a graph, and you're trying to decide if it's three colorable. Okay, you can color all the vertices using three colors such that all edges have their endpoints of different colors. Uh, that's hard. We don't know how to do it in polynomial time. Um, it seems like you know you just have to try. Um, on the other 
geo coloring, you can easily check. Okay, you just go through all the edges, you check that the endpoints are, are different. Uh, so, so problems that have this feature that uh, given the proof, you can easily verify the proof. Uh, th these problems are in the class uh, NNP, stands for non deterministic well, once again, we wish that all interesting problems were in, well, we wish they were in P, but, uh, but in fact, there's some interesting problems that are not even uh, in NP. Like we tend to think that, you know, every problem is kind of in NP. It's like this really hard class, but if that's not the case. Like a nice example is, uh, is graph non-colorability. Okay. You're given a graph and you want to say yes, if the graph is not colorable. How do you give a proof of that? Say, well, uh, you know, there, there's not really a proof that you can't color it. There's a proof that you can color it, but if you cannot, how do you convince someone that you cannot? They just, they just have to try. Um, in the 80s, 90s, uh, complexity theorists realized that, okay, in fact, uh, there are proofs of non-colorability and similar problems, but you need to change the model a little bit. Uh, you need to allow interaction. Um, and if you allow the verification, and randomization. So if you allow the verification procedure to be randomized, uh, what it means is that it can make errors uh, with some tiny probability. So for every problem instance, there can be a 1% chance that it makes an error, uh, but then you could run it many times and decrease the chance. So it's not, it's a, it's a mild caveat. Uh, a bigger change is that um, you're allowed to interact with the proof, but now we call them a prover. So instead of just saying, you know, please give me your coloring and I'll check it, you say, oh, you know, please say something. And then you, uh, you get the answer and then you ask them to say something else and you can leverage interaction in order to verify problems that lie beyond NP, uh, like that seem to lie uh, beyond NP, like graph non-colorability and uh, okay, cool, is, is. Problems that can be verified in this class has been characterized as P space. So that's all problems that you can solve um, using a bounded amount of space, for you know, but any time. So even if it takes you exponential amount of time to solve the problem, as long as you can do it using a polynomial amount of space, then also you can verify it efficiently using an interactive. Um, that's the case of graph non colorability Like if you had to do it yourself, how would you verify that the graph is not colorable? Uh, you just try all possible colorings. And that doesn't need so much space. Like you just write down the coloring, check it. And once you've checked it, you go to the next one. And if you order these colorings in some consistent manner, you're sure that you're never gonna check twice the same and you just go over the whole list. And then once you're done, then it's not colorable. Okay, so you can solve that in P space, and by the theorem, you can solve it in, in IP. So there's two reasons I'm, I'm saying all this. One is uh, just to recognize what going into the details that uh, interacting with a device can give a lot of leverage uh, to, the, uh, to the verification. And the other is that in principle, we could actually apply this to the problem of verifying quantum computations. Um, so BQP is the class of all problems that can be solved by quantum computers in polynomial time, for example, factoring. And it's well known and not hard to show that this is a subclass of P-space. So all the problems that you can solve in quantum polynomial time, you can solve in classical polynomial space. It, just, it could take exponential time, but the amount of space you need is not so much. So then there you are, right? By what I said just above, there are interactive proofs for verifying problems in, in BQP. Uh, but there's a problem with that. The problem is that if you follow the way that this is shown, um, there is going to be an interactive proof, but this interactive proof is going to require the prover to perform computations that lie beyond BQP, okay? They'll have to pull out the whole circuit and kind of map out the whole possible paths in the circuit and then do some computation on this whole computation on this whole, the whole space of the circuit, and then they'll be able to prove to you. Uh, so, um, uh, sorry, so, so that the, here there's a fascinating open question, uh, which I recommend, well, not recommend, um, suggest um, people to think about, which is uh, whether we can scale down this theorem and whether it is actually possible for quantum computations to prove themselves. So whether I could have a quantum polynomial time prover that proves to a classical polynomial time verifier that some quantum computation, uh, the outcome is, 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 is just mm -hmm. The hard questions, we're gonna to have to work our way around it. Uh, the general problem with the, with the model of interactive proofs is, and that's where the first bullet comes from, is that it doesn't really distinguish between different powers of, of provers. In general, you just say this prover, it's the one who comes up with the proof, they're just infinitely powerful and that's it. But if you want to use this in order to test an actual device or prover, you have to limit their power because they can't, they can't just answer any kind of uh, question you might ask them. 
the, the, the remainder of uh, like 15 minutes or so is going to leverage these ideas. The fact that randomization interaction, this can give power to verification, leverage these ideas, but we're not, we're not actually trying to verify like a quantum computation or something. I'll just take the, the simplest goal, which is we're trying to find um, an interaction that we can run that's going to distinguish between the classical provers and the, and the quantum and the quantum devices. Okay, so that if we run the interaction with a classical machine, it's always going to fail. But then there would be like a, as simple as possible quantum machine that succeeds uh, in the photography, I'm going to assume that some computational problem, I'll tell you a little bit later what the problem is, it's a very simple problem, is hard. Um, but it's not like factoring. I'm not assuming that something is hard for the classical devices and easy for the quantum devices and then that's it, right? That's my test. No, no, I'm going to assume that some problem is hard for everyone, okay? No one can solve that problem. This is just going to be some like pie in the sky kind of thing that no one can solve. But I use that as a foundation or a basis for, uh, for my test. So in the test, no one is going to solve the problem. But you'll see at some point how I'm using the fact that there was a hard problem to, to start with. So this is a much easier assumption to believe than having something that already separates classical and quantum, because the fact that there are hard problems, we're kind of willing to believe whether we are a believer in quantum computing or not. Like, sure, there, there are some hard problems for, for everyone. And then these are the, 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 the desiderata, so the, the things that we want to achieve. We want a protocol, we want it to be as easy as possible to succeed when you have a quantum device. You shouldn't be asked to solve any hard problems. Uh, on the other hand, if you have any classical device, you know, even a supercomputer or something, um, then, 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 then you shouldn't succeed in the protocol. And we'll set it up so that if a classical device was to succeed, then it would like indirectly break the computational problem. But, but we're not going to ask to solve it now. This, but um, it turns out that the approach that I'm going to describe to you in the next couple of slides is one that you can build a lot on. So I'll just only describe how to use it to separate quantum and classical, but you can build on it to uh, develop random computation, delegated computation, some other things that I might mention, you know, depending on time. Okay, so that's, I have just two slides that are kind of like the technical heart. So, um, you know, if you've seen this before, then it's okay, but if you haven't seen it, then, then it, it requires a little bit of, of your attention. Um, so we're trying to find the quantum advantage, right? We're trying to find a task that the quantum device can, can solve and not the classical one. Um, and we're going to use interaction, you'll see why. So the most you know, basic quantum advantage that we know of in, when we study quantum algorithms is, is Simon's algorithm. So this is one of the first algorithms um, that was discovered for, 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 for quantum algorithms. So let's, let me just recap what, what Simon's algorithm does. So you imagine that fixed somewhere is, is some function. It maps in with strings that have been strings. It's a two to one function, uh, which means that so it like collapses stuff like this. So it's not, um, it's not, uh, it's not injective or subjective, it's two to one. Um, and here's like, you know, once you have such a function and you know about quantum, what do you do? Okay, you do a superposition with all the inputs, you evaluate the function, you measure the output. And what you've done is that you've prepared a superposition over two pre-images of the same image, right? By measuring the image, the pre-image register collapses to just this little, um, this nice superposition. And then what's done, okay, let's measure this uh, in the Fourier basis. So you do a Hadamard transform, you measure, and if you do the calculation, what you see is that you get uh, a random string D uh, under the, then Simon's idea was to say, okay, well now suppose that this parity encodes uh, some kind of a secret. Uh, in addition, the function f, so that whenever you have two pre-images of the same image, their parity is some fixed secret. Then the equation d dot x0 plus x1, it becomes d dot s. Okay? And if I repeat this many times, I get many random equations. So d1 dot s equals zero, d2 dot s equals zero, d3 dot s equals zero. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to use Gaussian diminution and solve uh, for s. So this gives a separation because if you study the problem classically, you can argue uh, there is no way to recover the secret S using a classical algorithm. Um, it would require making two to the N over two, so exponentially many queries to the, to the function F. And so it gives you a separation, but the problem is that it's a separation in what's called query complexity. Uh, the main this is that we don't know of any function, like any concrete function for which there's a separation. We need to cook up this function, right? That is two to one, 
And that is such that the pre-images always XOR to the same string S. And if we could do that, and for that particular function or family of functions, we could show that it's hard to recover S classically, we'd be done. Um, but we don't know how to do that. So we don't know how to instantiate Simon's algorithm. So um, I'm going to change it a little bit. Um, I still want to make a um, couple of observations. So the first, this right here didn't work, but there is something here, which is that the quantum algorithm can prepare a superposition over two images. And that, that seems like it's really special. And I want, I, want, I want to use that. The first thing that I can do, and that one is easy, is take F to be what's called a collision resistant uh, function. So collision resistant function is one such that it's hard to find, given the function description, what's called a claw. What's a claw? A claw is a triple of two inputs that map to the same output. Okay, so it's collision resistant in that sense. You can't find collisions. So these functions, they're easy to construct. I can't use them for Simons because in general, they don't have the property that claws like X0 and X1 have some fixed parity. They'll be like some other random things. Um, but collision resistant function, I can construct them. And so it seems there, we're almost there, right? We're like, okay, so we have this function. I know that classical algorithms cannot find clause. They cannot find two pre-images in an image. And the quantum algorithm, it can find an image, why? And it can find the superposition. So if it measures the superposition, you only get one pre-image, okay? So it's not breaking collision resistance. But you want to say it's almost there, right? I mean, it, 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 this superposition has more than just one image, okay? In what sense it has more than one image? Well, I can measure it computationally to obtain one pre-image, but I can also measure it in the Hadamard basis. And even if the parity is not S, this measurement in the Hadamard basis is like some joint information about both pre-images. Okay, so in that like, kind of like really seemingly weak sense, the quantum device has more. Um, so assume the following. So assume that I can construct a collision resistant hash function. So it's just collision resistant, and it has an extra property. The extra property is the strengthening of collision resistance. I'm not saying it's hard to find two pre-images in the image. I mean, I am saying that, but I'm saying moreover, it's even hard to do something weaker. The weaker thing is and a non-trivial equation in the parity of But here I'm just saying it's hard to find just one equation. Uh, and so that, that's a strengthening of collision resistance, but the point is that we can achieve it. So we can construct explicit functions that have this property. So it's hard to find these things. And yeah. Um, um, there's no what, sorry? There's no concrete depth for Simon's algorithm, yeah. Do we know, is there a random? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so if you take a random function, yeah. But the problem is a random function, you can't really specify it. But we know that we find in query complexity. So you could interpret query complexity as saying that, uh, no, actually distribution, no, you can show for a random function. If, but, but there the model is that um, the algorithm, how does it access the random function? It can ask it to be evaluated at any points it wants, any points it wants, okay, that's my model. So if that's my model, then yeah, for a random function, there is no classical polynomial time randomized algorithm that solves the problem. Uh, yeah, that's it, there's no such algorithm, so yeah. There was another question. Probably, yeah. I'm saying probably because here there's no requirement on the distribution of D. So it could be always the same D that you get. Um, and so you can't immediately do like decoding, but maybe by, by changing a little bit the function um, you'd be able to force the adversary to generate different these. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not saying anything contradictory here, right? I'm, I said I want a problem that's hard for both classical and quantum, and I'm claiming this problem you can construct F so that it's hard for both classical and quantum. And indeed, my quantum algorithm cannot, you know, cannot solve the thing that's hard, right? The quantum algorithm can decide. So no one can do both. Um, and that's what the construction has. There you have your you have your test. So here's how the test is uh, is, is going to work. So you have the verification and device and the quantum device, and it um, the test I described works in, in four uh, messages. 
So first, uh, the verifier chooses that function uh, and it sends a description of it to the prover. I it's, um, it's, it's actually a really simple function. It's like a linear algebra function. So description of it is basically just a matrix. And the function sends x to you know, a dot x, and where a is the matrix. So you have to change that a little bit, but this is basically the kind of function we're talking about. So there's nothing funny going on here. Uh, why? Okay, so they do that however they want. And then we'll send them a challenge. And this challenge, they're interpreting as if the challenge is zero, they have to return a free image. And if the challenge is one, they have to return an equation. Okay. The first question is that if you have a, a, a quantum computer, not asked to solve any hard problems, okay? The way you succeed is that you just evaluate the function in superposition, measure the image register. So this will prepare the superposition x0 plus x1, like I had before. And if the challenge is zero, you measure in a standard basis, we return the outcome. If the challenge is one, you measure in a Hadamard basis, we return the outcome. Okay. So as a circuit, this is it's a fairly simple uh, circuit. It requires many qubits because n is, is large. So, uh, but, but it's not. It's a simple circuit. On the other hand, I claim, and it's very easy proof that no classical prover can succeed. Why? Um, and here it's, it's it's kind of interesting for those of you who know zero knowledge because we're we're using like the the opposite of what makes zero knowledge interesting in the quantum case, which is that um, a classical machine, you can rewind it, okay? So if a classical machine can answer challenge zero with some probability and challenge one with some probability, you can ask both in sequence, right? In principle, you can like freeze the memory of the device, tell it what's your answer to zero, then you can rewind and what's your answer to one, okay? So if you can answer both zero and one, you can answer both. You can answer zero and one, you can answer both. You, you, might, you might say, oh, I don't want to talk to you, right? But if you have the machine in your hands, in principle, you could, you could, you could wind it uh, and, and, and do it. So a classical machine that succeeds in this uh, must be able to solve the hard thing. Uh, and so by assumption, this thing is hard, it doesn't exist. The quantum machine, what saves it is that it's able to succeed, but I cannot rewind it because these measurements in the standard Hadamard basis, they're destructive. Once I've done the measurement, the state has been destructed. I can't do both measurements. In the, in the, in, in the same time. Okay. So that's that's what this protocol is testing is really that phenomenon. It's, it's testing the phenomenon that quantum measurements are not undoable, uh, that there is uncertainty, that that you know wave function collapses and you can't and you can't uh, and you can't go back. That's what I just said. So um, some experiments i maybe say these were just okay this was just a summary and i was going to tell you the problem but i skip it these are finally i'm not i didn't you can ask me for references they're, 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 what i'm describing is mostly based on the paper with Prokursky and quarters um and then that paper has seen a large number of follow-ups that build on the test of quantumness to do what i said earlier certified randomness and testing qubits testing even like entanglement inside the device testing quantum circuits so you can you can construct a lot of things on just this uh, this very simple um idea um there's some recent developments i wanted to talk about but instead of talking about them because i want to talk about my experiments i just point the third one so this there's some very exciting recent work that that does something a little bit different and uses less interaction and it's um I'm putting it out because there's a seminar about it in the, the Simons Institute in Berkeley has a colloquium and this colloquium takes place at 1 p.m. our time. So if you want to hear about follow-up works to what I'm describing by some other authors, I encourage you to watch this seminar at, at 1 p.m. It's in Zoom, you can find it, and it's also recorded, so you can watch it later if you, if you care. Um, I was going to describe what they do, but let me just skip that. Um, experiments, because for me, it's as a theorist, it's funny to... Of course, I didn't do these myself. So, so we had a collaboration over almost three years with uh, a group that does uh, ion traps at the University of Maryland. So this is Chris Monroe. And the particular experiment I'm going to describe, they were led by, by Crystal, who's, who's now on the faculty at Duke, and Dai Wei, uh, who's the one person who doesn't have a name, uh, uh, who's Let me just tell you uh, what we did very briefly. So this is the black box, okay? So it's literally a black box. This is as much information I got from the quantum device. And this is the picture that, that Chris sent us. So the number of qubits is, is, is not very large. It's like 13 qubits, but the fidelities are very high, which is what was important for us because the circuits we're running are, are pretty demanding. So um, here is the, the circuit. And the number of gates is 150. So there's 
So you can compute that the depth is like around a dozen uh, depth. And there's a layer of Hadamard's, then there's a classical circuit. This is the function that's evaluated in superposition. Then you measure the image at the bottom, that's the red part. And um, then later you get the challenge and you do the last Hadamard's or not, and then you make a measurement. It turns out that what was most uh, challenging and interesting about this experiment, uh, and I know there's an experiment in this room, probably not, but it, it's the idea of making a deferred measurement. So I learned this by doing this experiment. People, experimentalists, can set up a circuit and run it and measure for you. But if you ask them to measure something in the middle and change the rest of the circuit as a result of the measurement, um, not as a result of the measurement, change the result of the circuit, here is where the challenge gets flipped, right? So we get this challenge, and the challenge should be generated after the Y has been sent to the right. That's really hard. Um, and so that's another thing. So let me say how they did it with the iron traps. So that's an iron trap. Trap. So all the ions are on the left, and these purple beams, they're just like applying gates. So you run your circuit like this, but then you want to measure only half of them. So it turns out that you can't measure half of them when they're so close, you're going to just destroy everything. So instead, you had to split the chain in half and use some um, voltage, I think, to shift half the chain to the right, like kind of like isolate it. Then you measure half, and then you and then you bring the other uh, back. The picture at the bottom, it's some image of, of, uh, of what they did. So that was the main source of errors in the protocol. Um, because of this shuttling back and forth, it introduces some delays, and that introduces uh, phase uh, errors. And you can see these phase errors showing up in the results that we obtained. Um, let me show you these results. So we run, they run like tens of thousands of experiments, but there's different instances. And these are, so let's just look at the yellow one. And I'm almost done. Anyways, uh, I'm almost done. So um, yeah, I just finished. These errors don't matter. And so the two where you cheat, but the one where you measure the Hadamard basis, you can see that there's probably based on these phase errors. sure that these, in these experiments, we beat the best that could be done classically. So of course, there are small scale experiments, so you can simulate the whole thing. So this is not a demonstration of anything. It's just more proof of principle that the kind of protocols that we're describing can, on small instances, be executed on devices now. And there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done in order to you know, scale, uh, scale things up. The main advantage is that these things, at least in principle, can be scaled up. Okay? Verification is efficient. So you can run these kinds of protocols at 13 qubits like we did, also at 60, but also at 100, also at 200, also at 1,000. And there's interesting things that happen there. So I think this is like second generation kind of uh, test beyond the, the Google uh, test. I told you about challenges I just, I just One of the main challenges that, that, that prevents us from really having something convincing at 60 qubits is that because of the cryptographic assumption, this, this hard task, there's a bit of an overhead uh, there. And so doing back of the envelope calculations, in order to get a really interesting demonstration of quantum advantage, you would need not 60 qubits, but because of the overhead, something like 200 qubits. And these 200 qubits would need to have a small enough error. So that's beyond the reach of, of quantum experiments. Um, but hopefully within maybe five, 10 years, it would be. Um, these are questions. The first question is addressed in the talk that's happening at 1 p.m. Um, second one, I'll, uh, I'll skip. And the last one is a question that I'm interested in, 
which is which is really studying a little bit more in detail the noise tolerance of these protocols. Like a priori, um, they are very noise sensitive and it doesn't work if there's a bit of noise. Um, so you need fault tolerance, um, but let's say you try to work around that. And, and you know what happens if you actually run it in a noisy way, can you still get claims about um, what's been going on, about having a, a separation between quantum and classical computational advantage, et cetera. Okay, I'll stop here, sorry for, um, yeah, okay, I'll stop. I don't know if my sound is back in the Zoom. If it is, you can ask questions and those those. Yeah. I have a question about whether or not we can do something. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. So um, I know that there are some non black box approaches to that. Where you like compare two different machines, for example, like what how's that how, how that's called. Um, in this black box setting, um, there are some theoretical results actually that make delegated computation. I don't know if it's more practical, um, but potentially more practical. If, for example, you have like very small, like even just um, five qubits would be enough, and the quantum communication channel. Um, then that it turns out that gives you a huge amount of leverage because even just one qubit gives you some leverage because you've prepared a qubit, you know what it is, this is trusted in your lab and you're shipping it. And you're doing that many times and kind of like, and this really allows you to gain control over the computation space that, that they have. Um, yeah. Without the quantum communication link, then I don't know if it helps to just have another computer on the side. But it, Yeah. Do you know whether this is kind of necessary? No, um, it's a very good question. Um, it's very natural, okay? Because like really just, you know, what can a quantum computer do that a classical computer cannot do? They can create plus states, okay? And here we're just creating a plus state that's encoded. Zero is X zero, okay? So it's, so it's very natural in that respect. Um, it, but uh, no, in, in fact, the, Talk that's happening at 1 p.m. by Mark uh, Zandri. Um, achieves similar things, only the test of quantumness part, not further things, in a slightly different model. And uh, they use a function that's um, um, completely unstructured. Um, uh, so, it, so it doesn't, it's not two to one, for example. Um, uh, it's not so well enough to talk about it now, but it, it seems that. I guess the answer is, is no, it's probably not necessary. It's what we figured out how to do right now, but, but I think there might, there must be some other things and it's interesting to explore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can, oh no, I raised it for everyone, but I, uh, was, okay. The question is, does passing the CHSH game or any other proof of quantumness, such as Schwarz algorithm or the Mahadev delegation scheme. You'd have to qualify what this imply means. But for example, passing the CHSH game, it just means one qubit or let's say two qubits and run a very simple ship these qubits to two different places, or it should be staring at this. Um, uh, but that's it, you know, nothing more. Then the others were Schwarz algorithm. No, definitely not. I mean, uh, there could be like, uh, for all we know, there could be a classical algorithm for something Schwarz, Schwarz, uh, for, for, for factoring, um, or there could be some other kind of quantum algorithms uh, that, you know, that's the only thing they do, they, they factor, that's it. Um, for delegated computation, then yeah, I mean, if you're able to delegate the computation often general circuits to your device, then, then, it, can, then it can run uh, general circuits. But for all the smaller things, um, no, they just they just test you know wh whatever they're they're testing. But for that reason, it's important that uh, you know in, in the problem I presented there was an N, 
And you can choose this n and adapt it to your device. Okay, we used n equals 13, like in fact a bit less for the experiment I described. But if you had a device and you're telling me my device has 100 qubit, then I'd say, okay, like I can run my protocol for n equals 100 and we'll at least test that, 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 that you can do the problem for n equals 100. And that would just test that you can do n equals 100. It wouldn't test that you can do n equals 100. 